Phylogenetic trees are useful in a bunch of contexts, as we have seen in our course. One of these contexts is uh, just in uh, deriving biological classifications that uh, reflect evolutionary history and shared ancestry. Another one is in comparative analysis, where we just need to take that shared history into account because, well, the data that we're looking at, comparative data, is not independent uh, between our species. It's partly shaped by uh, shared descent. Uh, now, another way in which phylogenies are useful within the context of our course is that the trees also might tell us something about the process of biological diversification. So here the trees are basically uh, showing patterns which have been generated by some processes and those processes uh, in, in total are producing biological diversity. In this brief lecture I will revisit some of these processes and then we will look at what sort of patterns those processes might generate on trees and how we might quantify those patterns so that we uh, have basically a number, a metric, that uh, summarizes a pattern and that is uh, perhaps a symptom of some underlying process, but I will also go into what some of the problems are in actually drawing conclusions from any of these. Uh, but this is just to set the stage for some uh, subsequent demos where we actually try to uh, identify and tease apart different processes that might generate our patterns. So this all sounds very abstract, but we'll go through it and we'll try to make sense out of it. And so I'll... Uh, look at some fundamental models of diversification, first point. Then uh, I will look at some simple metrics that uh, are supposed to uh, summarize uh, what looks like uh, rate variation through time. So does the diversification process maybe change through time, speed up or slow down? Uh, and then uh, lastly, we'll look at some metrics that uh, might give us uh, some indication that there is rate variation not across time but across lineages so that some parts of the tree, some clades, might be diversifying at a higher rate than other clades. Okay, let's start uh, at the uh, uh, simplest point and this looks complicated but uh, don't worry, uh, let's go through this. So. We have seen in uh, at least one previous context this uh, notion of the Yule process or the pure birth process, namely when we were looking at species delimitation, where we said, well, uh, a, a phylogeny that is based on data where we both have molecular sequences within species and we have a couple of species, well, the distribution of branch lengths on that tree is basically generated by two processes and one of these was then the uh, coalescent process processes that are taking place within the different populations and the other process was the diversification process of different species splitting into new species and then that method uh, referred to that as Yule or pure birth but the in the abbreviation of the method was called Yule. Okay here that method comes back. So what basically are we talking about? We're saying, well, you know, any lineage, any biological lineage that's traveling through uh, evolutionary time could speciate. And the simplest null model is, well, it can just speciate at any given time. It's, it's traveling to time and some event happens, maybe some vicariant event, all of a sudden continent splits up or whatever, boom, speciation. And simplest model, well, that could just happen at any given time. And that, uh, that can go uh, on average 
uh, quickly at a high rate that can on average go slowly low rate uh, and so when there's then uh, such an event has happened then all of a sudden we have two lineages and they each of them can split now that rate um, here uh, for the remainder of these slides we are going to refer to it by the Greek letter lambda and a lambda is just dependent on one thing so uh, it's well the, the number of lineages that are in play basically so um, lambda if there's uh, two lineages well that is uh, twice lambda for when there is one lineage and another way of thinking about that is basically well there's a bunch of uh, participants in a lottery and uh, the more participants there are if they all have uh, one lot um, well then the odds of any of them winning at any given round of the lottery just goes up there's more players in the game okay uh, conversely when we uh, then think about okay so how long would it take for any one of them to win as there are more participants well that on average uh, goes down so the more participants there are the shorter the waiting time the waiting times get and and then the average is basically just one over the number of participants so one over n now if we wanted to simulate that then we might say okay so now what is the waiting time till the next speciation event and we want to just draw that so we're going to uh, for example uh, simulate a tree shape maybe because we want to have one for somewhere inside beast or for some other analytical reason we want to like we're building a mark of chain we're proposing a, a tree that has branch lengths that have been generated by your process well then we would have to draw those waiting times from an exponential distribution um, and so, uh, for example, if we then want to say, well, what is the probability of a split happening after some particular time on the x-axis? Well, for example, here then that graphic that shows that is uh, the, the one at the bottom, which shows the probability density function. So that if we want to know, well, what's the probability of a split at any given time x? Well, that would then be the area of the curve up until that point for the right value of lambda. And okay, then you'd have to uh, brush up on your calculus, like how did that work again um, uh, with the integral and all that stuff. Uh, not really relevant right now. Uh, maybe a little scary right now. Don't worry about it. But that's kind of the, the mechanics that are involved here if you were to simulate this sort of process. So that's just with uh, just lambda, the, the rate of births, basically. Now, I guess we know that uh, the Earth is just not only accumulating species and there's just more and more and more of them over the course of evolutionary time. No, no, no. Um, also, sometimes species go extinct. So there's also death. And... Uh, that basically just introduces one more uh, parameter, uh, which here we're going to refer to by the uh, Greek letter mu, which is basically then the extinction rate, right? Um, so this is kind of a similar idea. So uh, as there's more lineages in play, well, they are all also equally likely at any given time to go extinct and uh, so here of course you could also model this in in much more um, less sort of null model e type of ways uh, for example you know maybe some lineages uh, all of a sudden have some uh, trade values that make them more likely to speciate or more likely to go extinct like maybe all of a sudden there's a great uh, uh, sweep of extinctions that filters out all of the organisms that have this or that particular thing about their metabolism or whatever great big rock falls from the sky and everyone who can't do x or 
happens to do y all of a sudden goes extinct. So that's non-random extinction, but here we're just talking about random extinction, which uh, here also just happens at a rate uh, mu, which is then dependent on okay how many lineages are in play. So uh, at the top of the figure here, we just see the number of lineages going up through the birth process, and then uh, any of these could be taken out of the pool by the death process. We also played around with this in the uh, brow brow simulation, as you might remember. All right, now what's that look like on a tree as it is growing? And again, you might also remember this from the uh, brow brow simulation. Um, but basically, so what is happening as we are traveling through time is here shown in panel A. So we see lineages that uh, split and then those uh, accumulating lineages. Well, once in a while, um, one of them goes extinct. So then a, a branch uh, ends in panel A before it basically reaches the present. Now, uh, assuming that we don't have perfect fossil data, let's say, we actually end up looking at trees, so the pattern, the net pattern that in the end is produced, uh, as is shown in panel B, right? So we only see those things that make it to the present. And so this then becomes kind of the challenge. Um, we have these patterns, and then to what extent are those patterns shaped by changes in maybe birth rates, and to what extent are they shaped by changes in death rates? And that is not really trivial to tease that apart. So we're going to play around with that a little bit. Now here uh, is our good friend lineage through time plot uh, again. And here we have basically three trees that might illustrate three different uh, processes of diversification. So panel A, um, the first tree, the tree on the left, shows broadly speaking just a linear accumulation of lineages with no changes through time. And you might remember that then on the x-axis there's time, so we're traveling from the root to the tips uh, to the present. So there, hence there's negative numbers on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis is our number of lineages log transformed. And okay, it it looks a little jagged, but uh, right, roughly you could uh, say okay, there's just a, a linear after log transformation, just a linear uh, increase. Now. Uh, these other two trees, that's a little different. So, for example, on tree C, obviously, you see that uh, later on, the number of lineages starts accumulating much more quickly. Now, it's not super obvious what actually is happening there, because from the previous slide, you might recall that just some lineages that don't make it to the present basically just disappear out of sight. And that could have been the case, so it could have been that earlier on there was extinction and we just don't see those lineages, or later on uh, the speciation rates have gone up. And it's just not super straightforward to tell those two apart. Uh, now panel B uh, basically shows the opposite. So here we see that at first the uh, number of lineages increases quite rapidly and later on that slows down. And now, for example, one uh, kind of model or sort of hypothetical model for that is basically a kind of density dependent uh, diversification. So here then the idea is that uh, early on, there's uh, you know ecological opportunity to take advantage of, and uh, oh my goodness, there's lots of uh, ways in which we be can become a new species because there's lots of niches to fill, and then at some point those fill up, uh, and uh, basically the the diversifying clade is getting closer to the carrying capacity, and so we don't get as many lin more lineages coming into play. Now, uh, we can see, look at this kind of like graphically and uh, look at the uh, shape of these lineage through time plots, but it might be useful if we can just express that in a number. 
So, for example, here's here's one of those, um, the so-called uh, gamma metric, and basically it uh, tries to summarize, okay, in which direction do the nodes on the tree tend to, to fall? So are they more towards the present or more towards the root? And uh, it turns out that... Um, basically under under null conditions that uh, tendency uh, as expressed by this gamma metric is normally distributed so here you can see a whole bunch of trees being uh, simulated and then when you summarize where do the nodes fall in that uh, gamma metric you uh, get after the simulation has been run for a thousand trees here uh, we get what looks pretty much like a normal distribution as, as we would expect under uh, basically non-model circumstances. And so for any given tree, for example, you can also just uh, check whether that uh, really falls, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of our normal distribution or whether somehow it, uh, it deviates from that. And then, okay, is that actually a significant deviation? So, for example, in R with this package ape, you could read in a tree, and then the ape package has a function uh, gamma stat, and that gives on the, us then this, this gamma number, and then we could see, okay, where does it fall uh, within a normal distribution? And here, for example, we can do a two-tailed test to see if it's deviating from that. So then we could say for any given tree, oh my goodness, uh, the nodes are significantly, uh, you know, uh, closer to the root than we would expect, uh, or uh, significantly more, you know, towards the present. Let's say. Now, how is that actually generated? And uh, now here, kind of the idea is, well, maybe. Uh, we see this like early diversification or late and we don't really know if that's true if that's like this metric doesn't tell us anything about whether this is for example because of uh, higher speciation rates early on or actually just high extinction rates or any of that also it doesn't tell us anything at all about whether maybe there's differences in different parts of the tree so that for example some clades might be uh just diversify more rapidly than other clades. So that brings us to the topic of linear specific processes. Uh, so here uh, there's been a couple of metrics that were kind of developed to basically just put in one number how balanced or unbalanced a phylogenetic tree is. So here on the left, you can see obviously about well, that tree is more symmetrical or more balanced. So starting from the root, uh, for example, on either side of the root, uh, there's four descendants uh, going towards the tip. So there's it's very evenly, uh, you know, symmetrically weighted on, on either side. And the tree on the right is actually uh, fully unbalanced. So uh, from the root going left, there's just one branch leading to the present and on the right, there's everybody else. Um, and then from there, uh, going from the root to the tips, there's uh, at each time just one branch basically branching off. And so one way in which you might explain this is to say, well, maybe uh, that lineage going right has kind of a heritable sort of evolvability or sort of a capacity for generating more new species, uh, whereas on the left there's not that capacity. So there's kind of like maybe evolvability, something like that. So uh, how might we express that? Uh, now again, uh, there's uh, some tooling for that. So for example, just very early on, there was this metric that um, uh, expresses imbalance. And basically it, it walks across the tree and it looks at, okay, how many uh, tips for any given node uh, go left and how many go right, essentially. 
and then we do that for all interior nodes and we get uh, this this value which then expresses the imbalance um, now it turns out that with this particular metric it is kind of uh, it puts kind of a high weight on the uh, the deep nodes just because uh, near the root the absolute difference between left and right can be a lot greater than as you get close to the present so for example then um, later on other metrics were uh, developed that kind of uh, well they, they introduce an additional parameter that kind of tries to normalize uh, like how you know the difference between left and right weighted by the uh, total number of descendants so it's kind of supposed to act against this uh, bias towards heavier weighting of nodes near the root okay so that's that's uh, interesting um and now what was kind of also interesting about these metrics is that it uh, uh, allowed uh, us to kind of um come up with uh, expected distributions for well if trees for example uh, evolve by pure birth or by birth death processes then how uh, unbalanced are they and so this would then give us you know like a, a theoretical distribution and then well wouldn't it be interesting to actually go and look at what the actual distribution is if we just go into the literature and just see okay how unbalanced are those trees so this was done already like a long time ago but what was kind of neat about this is that here the uh, 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 actual trees which are indicated by the uh, square uh, points are more imbalanced so higher val values on the y-axis are uh, you know imbalanced and you get more asymmetrical as you go further up on the y-axis um, well so for the actual trees uh, they, they are uh, basically always more imbalanced than for then what you would get if you just were to simulate trees uh, with the same number of tags, all right? So on, then on the x-axis, like, okay, how, how imbalanced are trees with uh, four tags uh, or with uh, five, six, seven, uh, all the way through uh, 14 here. So it turns out that um, what we actually see in nature, or to be precise, what was seen in uh, reconstructed uh, trees in 1992, well, those are more imbalanced than we would expect just from these uh, simple uh, uh, birth-death uh, processes. So who knows, maybe there's other things happening, such as this heritable evolvability. So this kind of sets up the, the, the problem space. Uh, you know, there's uh, on tree shapes, there's uh, basically how asymmetrical they are and that might tell us a little bit about lineage specific variation in diversification rates and there's basically this this nature of well how early or late are the splits and what that's sometimes called is uh, well if uh, trees have very long stems so early branches coming from the root if those are very long and most of the splits are near the tips those trees are said to be stemmy <laughs> and uh, if instead the terminal branches are very long and most of the splits happen near the root well then the tree is said to be branchy and okay so what kind of processes might generate that um, it could be uh, you know differences in either speciation rate or extinction rate or maybe uh, something else even like linear specific let's say but this is kind of the problem area and uh, so uh, what we will do next is uh, play around with some methods that then at least attempt to uh, tease apart what might be the processes that are generating these patterns So thank you for listening.